Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual EDC Clean Tech Export Week. My name is Dan Mancuso, EDC's Senior Vice President of Financing and Investments. I'm pleased today to serve as the MC for the day one of the 2021 edition of Clean Tech Export Week. To all of you tuning in today, I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us for what I'm certain will be a week of insights, learning, connections, and inspiration. The team at EDC has assembled an excellent lineup of content and speakers that will dive into the trends, challenges, and opportunities for the clean tech industry in Canada. There's no doubt that Canada is a leader in clean technology and innovation. And this week will be an opportunity to showcase Canada's clean tech industry. Before we launch into our program today, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples and the lands we all call home today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a, a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we all call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. I myself am joining you from Ottawa today and the peoples of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for time and millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this place. I encourage you to take a moment to think about the lands in which you're joining us from today. I'd also like to extend my sincere thanks for our partners, customers, stakeholders, and the clean tech ecosystem in Canada for your support and collaboration on this year's edition of Clean Tech Export Week. You'll be hearing lots from them over the next two days. I encourage you all to explore the Whova platform leverage the virtual networking options, and of course, tune in live for the next two days to hear from a range of clean tech leaders on the themes that are top of mind for the industry right now. Each year, it brings me great excitement and pride to announce Canada's clean tech export stars as we acknowledge a select group of companies whose clean technologies are making a positive impact around the world. Not only have these companies, Canadian companies, proven to be leaders in the fight against climate change, but they've also exemplified resiliency and perseverance amid the global crisis. Our hope is that these success stories, along with the insights and opportunities offered during this week, will both inspire companies and support continued growth within the sector. Without further delay, I'm pleased to announce our first Export Star of 2021. Please join me in congratulating Green Mantra Recycling Technologies Limited, a company with an innovative approach to recycling plastics. We're producing high value specialty polymers from waste plastic and our products are being used as performance additives in a variety of different industrial applications, including asphalt paving, plastics processing and roofing. And what sets us apart from our competition is really up until Green Mantra, most specialty polymers were only produced from fossil sources. So we're the first company in the world to commercialize better performing green specialty polymers for use in the applications we serve. The push to net zero has certainly allowed for more investment into the clean tech sector. We're also seeing more government policy that's supporting the growth of clean technology companies like Green Mantra. But probably for us, one of the biggest impacts has actually been with our customers on the commercial side. The renewed desire to increase sustainability within their product portfolio has allowed us to grow even faster within new markets. So we've been working with EDC really since the beginning, and they've been able to provide us support through various products, including insurance on our account receivables and on term loans. And those products have allowed us to do things like enter the US market much sooner than we anticipated, but also focus capital that we're getting into the company really on growing the business. So for us, the future is bright and exciting at Green Mantra. We are a commercial business, but we're very much in our growth phase. So we're looking next at expanding our manufacturing footprint, not only within Canada, but globally within the US and Europe, as well as expanding our commercial footprint, continuing to grow our export globally. And really our target is to be the world leader in green specialty chemicals. Congratulations to Green Mantra for being our first export star of the program. We'll announce the other winners throughout the program, so stay tuned for more winners and videos. I now have the pleasure to introduce EDC's Chief Economist, Peter Hall, for an economic outlook of the clean tech sector. 
With over 25 years of experience in the economic analysis and forecasting, Peter is responsible for overseeing EDC's economic analysis, country risk assessment, and corporate research groups. Peter is a featured speaker at conferences, international roundtables, and policy fora, and regularly appears in television, radio, and print media commenting on the world economy and Canadian international trade issues. He produces a widely circulated print and video weekly commentary covering a range of current global economic issues. Peter, thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real delight to be with you and to share insights that have been prepared by EDC's economics team uh, regarding the world economic outlook. It's a really messy situation right now. <clears throat> it has been for a number of months. And what we want to do is to sort through some of what is going on right now, the chaos of the of the numbers, the global situation, the pandemic and so forth, but not just to give an information dump on that, to really get down to the point of saying, okay, given that this is a situation that we are in, what do we do about it? What do we walk away with in terms of strategic insights? And uh, how do we how do we actually operate our businesses and what are the implications for the clean tech sector as as we go forward? So thank you once again for uh, for having me here to do this. Um, our outlook is entitled this time around the fork in the road. And this comes from the inimitable quipster Yogi Berra, who said, when you get to the fork in the road, take it. And at first we sort of scratch our heads, we giggle because that's what Yogi Berra makes us do with, with all of the quips that he comes up with. But we're left thinking, thanks a lot. Um, that's really not good advice for me at all you've actually bypassed the challenge here. I'm confronted with a choice. I've got to go one way or the other. I cannot just take this thing. It's even more insulting when an economist says that kind of thing to you, because it's like what George Bernard Shaw said, you know, I've met many, many handed economists in my life, you know, who say on the one hand, on the other hand, and there never really is a conclusion about things. So why it is? Why is it that I would insult the audience by entitling my forecast that way? Well, the world economy has actually taken the fork. This isn't something I'm recommending that we do. It's already happened. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's get right into the presentation. And of course, any economic outlook presentation right now has to start with the pandemic. So in what sense are we taking the fork in the road? Well, here's how it goes. We were told by health authorities that once we got to this particular stage here with immunization, so this is the extent of double vaccinations, this is the Johns Hopkins data that we're talking about here. Once we got to the stage where we saw many countries in the upper part of all of this, we would be much closer to achieving herd immunity. Now, we all know that herd immunity is the combination of this together with naturally acquired immunity. And the Israeli studies are telling us right now that naturally acquired immunity is actually more effective against COVID-19. So we combine those two things together and we get to herd immunity. Well, we knew that we would be in this particular predicament by the time we got here. And so what we said in terms of our economic outlook was fasten your seatbelts, get prepared for rocketing growth. And the reason that we said that is there was a whole lot of pent up demand in the world economy, particularly in the United States and in Western Europe, ahead of COVID actually occurring. So once we got beyond the pandemic, that pent up demand would actually become active and herd immunity would cause an opening of the economy that would cause all kinds of compromise in terms of managing growth, supply chain difficulties and so forth. And we're seeing some of those things right now, except this COVID-19 nut has not been cracked yet. Even with the degrees of vaccination that we are actually seeing around the world in some of the most vaccinated places and the earliest to be vaccinated, we are still seeing outbreaks that actually surpass what we had seen before. So what was the remedy in the past? Well, every time we had an outbreak, we shut the economy down, either completely or partially, locally. And so this time around, with vaccinations having occurred with herd immunity, actually with us being much closer to herd immunity, why on earth, <clears throat> excuse me, are we having the outbreaks that we are seeing at the moment? Well, this time around, health authorities, policymakers are saying, well, look, we're not going to shut the economy down. We can't do that into perpetuity. 
So this time around, because of lower hospitalizations and lower mortality, we have COVID that is continuing to go on and we have an economy that is strong. So the world economy, the world population, world policymakers are taking the fork in the road. We're allowing the economy to rocket on and we're managing the pandemic. There are more studies that are coming out that are saying, well, look, this has become endemic now. And so economies like Norway are deciding to open up free movement right now because uh, they realize that they are now close to the achievement of this herd immunity and they can move on. Many others are not coming to the same conclusion, but of course, this will be very gradual as we go forward. So if that's the way that we're actually handling the pandemic right now and we're not foreseeing these kinds of shutdowns, then we get back to how do we manage growth in the world economy? And everybody's got to deal with this right now because the way that uh, the economy is going forward is actually uh, red hot uh, at the moment. Let's start with the consumers of the world. They make up about 60% of global GDP in any given economy. In the United States economy, it's actually 70%. So we look to them as a gauge of how things are going. And any way you add it up, U.S. consumers are red hot at the moment. And by the way, they're not the debt-loving U.S. consumers that we knew about prior to the global financial crisis in 2007. They have got their debt situation under control. Their savings rates are higher. Their debt-to-income ratios are way lower. So this 18% increase that is not from the chasm, but it's from pre-pandemic levels of activity is a very solid rebound. We are seeing the same here in Canada. We are seeing the same in Western Europe. Now it's not as dramatic as the increase in the United States, but growth here beyond pre-pandemic levels is a sign that the world's consumers are healthy, they are getting back out uh, there and they are spending. And that's very good news for global GDP and for global growth. Now, this is about 50% of world GDP, and this is just a sample, but it's a very good sample of what's going on in the broader world economy. So demand is back. Now, you might say, is it just consumers? No, it's not. Global trade adjusted for price movements is actually growing quite handily as well. So it's currently 6% above. Now, it might not feel that way in advanced economies because we're only up 1.5%, but emerging markets are up 16% on a real inflation adjusted basis. So there is something very dynamic that is going on in the world at the moment. Now this is causing us some difficulties in the world because managing this growth has been quite difficult. So point number one, you know, the pandemic still seems to rage ahead and we're getting to that endemic level. So some good news in there. Point number two is world growth is very strong and growing. Point number three really is how are we managing it? Well, this slide here actually shows us that growth is not even. And that's a bit of a problem because we know that uh, in terms of global shipping, all the ships are in the wrong places and all the containers seem to be in the wrong places. We seem to have enough of them. You know, we're starting to push the limits on the capacity of that uh, at the moment. But by and large, as the economy has gotten back on its feet again, uh, we found that all the pieces that we need are sort of in the wrong places. They're there, but they're in the wrong places. So how do we actually characterize this? Well, uh, prices are the only absorption uh, mechanism for this. And you can see that in terms of bulk shipping, things are going crazy. When we look at containers, same thing is happening. You know, some of the edge may be coming off at the end there, but for the largest ships in the world, prices are still way up there. And uh, it's very, very difficult to either get a ship or to get uh, any kind of um, container activity going on. When you layer in all the classes of container ship, the Harpex index is still rising exponentially uh, right up to, uh, to the latest data that we have. Anecdotal information says, that these shipping costs are starting to come down again, but they're at tremendous highs at the moment. It's just very difficult to move things around the world. There's all the desire to move it, uh, but it's just very difficult to do. Now you might say, well, why has this occurred if the capacity is actually out there? Well, part of it is because of uneven growth. Part of it is because very few people around the world actually believed that growth was going to take off this way. So the resumption of the economy has taken us by surprise. It's very easy to shut an economy down. It's not easy to bring an economy back on. You might say, well, growth should 
you know, be the motivator to actually do that. Well, when you've gone through several waves of COVID, you know, you're on again, you're off again, and so forth. Once policymakers declare the economy open, it's then up to businesses to say, okay, well, you know, are we going to bet the farm on it this time around or not? And there is a bit of hesitation that's actually going on. So uh, that is part of the difficulty that we are seeing uh, at the moment, and it is causing these price pressures. Now, it's one thing for upstream price pressures to be a problem. Are they actually getting passed on to the consumer? Well, unfortunately, they are. It has made its way right to consumer prices in the United States. This is well above what the Federal Reserve Board is comfortable with. And the latest number actually just a couple of days uh, ago came out and U.S. CPI is up 5.4% uh, on a year over year basis. Now, up until now, uh, central banks have been telling us, well, this is temporary. Um, but if business costs are actually getting passed into consumer costs, then the producer price index is indicating that this isn't as temporary as they were hoping it would be. And the Bank of Canada has started to intimate that that's actually the case. You know, business costs are not going down. They're a leading indicator of what consumers are going to have to pay. And so this is going to persist for a little bit longer. Now, consumer prices can actually move uh, quite quickly back down. And so as long as, you know, the, the uh, general public is convinced that this is a temporary thing, prices can come back down again. But we've got the same problem in Canada. Our costs are accelerating and we're moving up to the 4% uh, level uh, of year-over-year uh, -year price increases at the moment. The scale on the left-hand side is actually changed here, so it doesn't look like we're too radical here. Uh, but the reason the scale has changed is this is what's happening to our producer prices here in Canada. So if they're eventually going to get passed into the consumer, then we're in the uh, same trouble as the United States uh, is in at the moment. Now, it's one thing for consumer prices to move around like this. This is demand pull inflation, and it can change quite a bit as long as we get to the point where supply actually starts to meet demand. But the dangerous thing about what's going on right now is that our labor market is tightening up, not just in the United States, not just in Western Europe, uh, which is less dramatic than the U.S. because of their greater aging population, but uh, also here in Canada. We are reaching very, very tight levels of labor capacity. And now in Canada, we have very little buffer because our participation rates are actually getting up to pre-pandemic levels. So we don't really have a whole lot of wiggle room uh, as the economy is opening up. And this is now getting into the more dangerous part of prices where wages are starting to spike. And so in the United States, look left. That's the scale that we're looking at here. They have jumped up to the 5% level. And you can see on the chart here, we haven't seen that for an awful long time. And in Canada, we've had a bit more of a problem here with our tightness of labor. So we're back up into about the 7.5% zone. And that's way north of what central banks are comfortable with. So one of the key takeaways from this is, look, you know, if we're managing through the pandemic, if growth is very strong, if we're having a hard time actually accommodating growth, and it's actually getting into the more sticky uh, prices like wages, you know, wages go up, they don't go down very easily, as we all know. Well, then this is starting to set into pricing behavior. And uh, we are we are actually running into the problem that we that we don't have enough capacity to facilitate the growth uh, that is actually out there. Well, is the growth actually going to continue? Well, if we look at confidence, businesses are very confident, consumers are very confident here in Canada. They're also very confident in the United States. They're confident in Western Europe. So in spite of the difficulties that we're feeling, everybody seems to be able to see growth out there. Now, why might that be the case? Well, there's a lot of money around in the system. This is usually uh, an extremely boring indicator. It doesn't really do very much. I've never used it in my entire career. Demand deposits are boring because we keep as little as we can in our checking account. It doesn't yield us anything. But COVID came along and all of a sudden took away a lot of the things that we spend on, like the daily commute, like going on vacations, like going out to restaurants or hockey games or concerts, a whole range of things that we were not doing. What happened to all that money? Well, all of a sudden, the demand deposits started to explode. And in the United States, this adds up to about 17% of GDP. Now, just to give you a sense of how powerful this is, if it all washed back into the economy all at once, I would have to revise the growth rate up by, you guessed it, 17 percentage points. 
I'd be excited about two to three percentage points, folks. So you think you got a problem with supply chains and inflation now. This is a whole storehouse of pent-up demand that's not just in the United States, but it's also in Western Europe. And yes, we also have the same situation happening in Canada. This is extra cash, folks, ahead of what we would normally have accumulated. And so this can come into the economy at any particular point in time. So what it's telling us is that for a number of years now, uh, uh, into the future, we are going to have a reserve of cash that will keep the economy going, even though stimulus is being withdrawn from the economy. So that's good news, you know, and that's probably why our consumers are confident. They see that uh, this capacity is actually there and that things can roll forward. So what does it do for the whole clean tech sector? Like, how is the economy actually responding to all of this? Well, there is a level of energy intensity in the economy, and it doesn't change much over time. And so while the economy is coming back, you know, we've all enjoyed the lower levels of fossil fuel usage and the carbon release uh, into the economy as a result of that. We've all enjoyed the cleaner air that we've experienced over this period of time, and everybody would love this to continue. But the difficulty about an economy coming back on again is that those intensities of usage of fossil fuels or clean energy sources. They don't change radically as a result of an interruption in the economy. We would all love it if that would be the case and that cleaner energy could be a part of the economy that is now growing again and burgeoning, but we just can't react uh, that quickly. So what we are seeing right now is that 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 inventories which surged over the COVID period of time because usage was so low are now coming back down very, very rapidly in emerging markets. And emerging markets now have inventories that are greater than our own. But our inventories inside of OECD countries are now below where they were pre-pandemic. And that's why we're seeing some uh, difficulties here with keeping up with supply. So here's the difference between supply and demand. And you can see that at the very right hand side, the bars are negative. Supply is not keeping up with demand. And of course, that bar is about as low as it's ever gotten in this entire continuum here. So here's what demand and supply are actually looking like uh, on the uh, left hand side uh, scale uh, here. And you can see that demand is surging way above demand, uh, way above supply uh, here on a global basis. So this is why we are seeing prices respond the way they are. Prices are shooting up here. Uh, and sorry, my labels on the left hand side are wrong. These are prices for oil and for natural gas. And uh, you can see the price markers that I'm actually using there. Okay, so what does this do for our situation inside of clean tech? How do we respond to a global economy that's bursting at the seams here and uh, now bringing fossil fuels back in uh, to the mix? Well, given the strictures that we are seeing at the moment, when fossil fuel prices start to rise, well, you know, the, um, the incentive, I guess, for higher cost clean tech solutions uh, actually rises. Uh, the incentive to invest there and to push forward with uh, new developments and cheapening uh, what is available to us in a clean tech sense. Higher prices are not necessarily a bad thing. The realization that we're back into fossil fuels, of course, enervates the whole argument about moving forward with cleaner sources of energy. So it's back into the picture, it's into the spectrum, and we may not like the situation the way it is right now, but unfortunately, that's the reality as we go forward. So it leads to a whole host of questions about where the policy is actually at on this front. How do we respond to a situation like this? Uh, how do we move forward? And so in the Q&A that we have and the discussion that I'm going to have with Chris Reagan coming up, we can pick up on some of these issues here. This, by any stretch of the imagination, is very strong global growth. Uh, so right across the spectrum, whether you're talking about the developed world, the emerging world or total world growth right now, we are well ahead of our long term ability to grow this year and next. And that's actually going to spill into 2023. So managing that and uh, creating a cleaner world uh, through this entire process, well, that's the challenge that we have as the economy comes back. 
Um, here's our currency, our interest rate forecast. We are expecting interest rates to go up uh, as we move forward, as the economy tightens in a way that accommodates growth as we go forward. Well, what are the main points that we've actually made today? The world economy is definitely hot. Supply chains keeping up, that's the big challenge. Inflation is going to be an issue that we need to manage. We need business investment and clean tech investment in order to keep up with things. The sources of growth will be shifting, so we have the emerging economies that are uh, that are in the mix and that we have to deal with. Their accession into world growth, the industry mix is also shifting. We need to accommodate that. And of course, there are many risks that we need to think about. Managing through the pandemic is a key one of those. Uh, inflation and higher interest rates, uh, we will need to manage. The unwind of stimulus will affect the clean tech sector. Uh, uh, and so one needs to keep one's eyes on how fiscal finances and how they have changed are going to help us or hinder us going forward. Geopolitics are going to get in the way of what it is that we do. And of course, there's always the chance that growth is higher than what we had forecast. And we will need to continue to manage that as we go forward. Well, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And we will now get into the discussion uh, with myself and Chris Reagan. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us today. I, I've heard that we've got about a thousand uh, people on the line uh, today. And so I'm just delighted to swing into this portion of our discussion. I trust that uh, you found some of the insights that I was sharing in the presentation uh, useful, trying to bring the, the world economic picture uh, closer to home and to uh, segue that into the uh, to clean tech sector. Well, I couldn't be happier than to uh, dovetail that into a discussion with uh, a, a colleague and a very good friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Chris Reagan. Uh, he is uh, Associate Prove uh, Professor in McGill's Department of Economics or the Department of Economics at McGill University. And he is the founding director of McGill University's Max Bell School of Public Policy. And so uh, he is and his students are all over the issues that we are going to be talking about today. But uh, his sort of span of influence has gone much further than that. Um, Dr. Reagan uh, was the founding chair. That, that word founding is, uh, is appearing a little bit uh, too often here, uh, Chris. The founding chair of Canada's Eco-Fiscal Commission. I can remember sitting uh, with, uh, with Chris in the train station in Montreal as he was talking about his ideas on eco-fiscal coming together. And this has been something that I believe has been instrumental in forming Canadian policy uh, around how to fund uh, the, the clean tech initiatives that, uh, that we have in our economy, how to uh, actually design policy around a cleaner Canada. And of course, I believe that others around the world have looked to the work of our Ecofiscal Commission in terms of designing their own approaches to that. Well, he launched that in November of 2014, and they had a finite five-year horizon to actually identify policy options to move Canada forward. So uh, that's going to come into our discussion today and to talk a little bit about where it is that we are at uh, today. Uh, Chris has done many other things uh, in addition to all of that. Uh, one of the things that we economists know him for, of course, is he is the author of, of, one, of, uh, of one of the key texts, the most widely circulated principles texts that Canadian students use when they first start studying uh, the economy. And uh, he is renowned for uh, how active and exciting and engaging his economics classes are. I've spoken to many of his students and former students who have said one of the reasons they got fired up as economists, of course, was because of the influence that he had on them in his lectures. He has published books. He has published many articles. Chris, we are so glad to have you here today. I hope I haven't embarrassed um, you uh, into uh, into silence uh, here. I hope that's not the case. But um, not at no, all. We thank you. Peter, thank <laughs> you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and great presentation. I um, and and, I, and I've jotted down some things, so I'm ready to to hit you up with some with, with some issues on this. But thank you for having me. 
Well, that's great, Chris. It's a, it sure is a delight. It just feels like a couple of friends getting together. And you, of course, you've put everybody at ease with your beautiful uh, fireside uh, that is behind you there. That's <laughs> well, invited that's me to a fireside chat, so I've got myself my, there you my go. background fireplace. Okay, I think I gave us uh, a few things to think about inside of the presentation. Thanks for your kind comments about that, Chris. I know you're very uh, picky about uh, about presentations and so forth. Um, so that's high praise uh, coming for you. Why don't you uh, hit me with your best shot here? Okay, well, so I was struck by, so as you know, Peter, uh, the people in the audience may not know, but I'm primarily a macroeconomist. I spent the first whatever 28 years of my life thinking about central banks and inflation and exchange rates and you know the, the rest of monetary policy. So I was struck by your presentation. And uh, it's pretty hard, frankly, to walk away from your presentation and not be concerned about inflation. Mm -hmm. um, yet what we hear from the European Central Bank or the US Fed or the Bank of Canada or the Bank of England is that don't worry, this is temporary. But that's not what I was thinking when I was listening to you speak. Uh, you show the demand deposits kind of going off the chart. You show high growth. You show consumption that is kind of going off the charts. So there's a whole bunch of sort of classic demand indicators that are going off the charts. So why do, why aren't the central banks talking more about this or why don't you appear to think that this is just temporary? Because that's what they seem to think. Mm. Well, you know, they have changed their narrative in the last little while. It's it's very hard to figure out, you know, exactly how much more hawkish they're becoming. Uh, but it's a bit of irritation to them. You can sense that they are uneasy with the extent to which prices are still going up. Well, when I see this is where I'm going to get a little geekish on everybody. But when I see the month to month increases rising at, a, at an annualized rate that is greater than the target, and that continues for month after month after month, I've got to ask myself, well, how temporary is temporary when the year over years get up to the point where they're at right now? Even if US CPI goes to a monthly increase that we would say is within target, by the end of the year, we're still going to have year over year numbers that look something like 5.1%. And we haven't seen that, as you know, for, for decades. So actually getting this into our, our frame of thinking right now is very difficult. And so for this, this affects regular businesses all over the place for the clean tech industry as well, trying to get a hold of the higher tech elements of production that are out there are pretty problematic at this point in time. One of the greatest strictures in the world is around semiconductors. And this is a very, you know, semiconductor intensive uh, set of industries that we've got uh, around us today. That's not the only thing. Primary materials are in short supply as well. And if you can actually locate some of these things, trying to get them into some kind of logistics network, <laughs> you know, with trucks that are running, with trains that are on time, and with ships, of course, and containers that are able to traverse the globe on time. Well, that's very, very problematic right now. So for all of those reasons, it doesn't seem as if this is going to be something that is over right away. Now, do I believe it ultimately is going to be temporary? Well, I was the one that said, I think we've got enough stuff on the planet. We certainly got enough raw materials. We got enough ships, they're just in the wrong places. And, you know, Samsung and others keep telling us, you know, by mid next year, we think we're gonna see ourselves through this. This has just sort of taken us by surprise. So in that sense, it's temporary, but is it temporary enough to keep from getting into wages and creating a bit of a spiral here? That's the big question mark. But exactly the wages I wanted to mention. So you showed two graphs to me that suggest Yes, it could be temporary. Of course, temporary still be a, maybe a few years. But mm. when you see the demand deposits growing that fast, uh, and you know, just more generally, the central banks, of course, pumped a huge amount of liquidity into the system. So at some point, that starts to feed credit growth, and that requires central banks to then start reversing those actions at well, to at least slow them down and then start reversing them if they get the timing right. But also, your data on wages shows that. <clears throat> that that's already getting itself into wages. And then it's kind of just a hop, skip and a jump to get into inflation expectations. And once right. those inflation expectations take off, then maybe 
you know, the cat's out of the bag. And then it's just that much harder for the central banks to really start pulling it back. So I, again, when I listen to you speak, both the presentation and your answer, I think I'm not so sure why we should all be so sanguine that the central banks are going to get this right and that we'll only have a couple of percent inflation for a couple extra percentage points for a couple of years. I, I'm just not so confident. Yeah. Well, you know, for the business people that are around the table, one thing I need to add, uh, Chris, and that is, you know, as we put all of this stuff together, of course, uh, the shareholders of of corporations, the venture capitalists that are behind the initiatives of, of some of you who are around the table today, your financiers are all saying, well, we know that your input costs are going up. We're, we're now hearing that your, you know, wage pressures are rising. And we're kind of concerned about your margins, okay? Your input costs are going up. What about your selling uh, prices? And we've just finished a, a tour around the country where we've done a bit of straw polling. And you know, it's, it's quite surprising how people are saying, you know, for the first time in their lives, they can remember uh, they are passing on eight, nine, 10, up to 15% price increases and people aren't even batting an eye. They just want to get their hands on stuff. So the pressure is definitely there inside of inside of companies to preserve those margins and to say, well, look, you know, I, I've got to compensate for these rising input costs. And as I go out into the marketplace, I'm not having any trouble doing that. Well, we also asked them a question, Chris, about price expectations going into next year. I don't think you want to know, but you know, when we averaged our numbers out. Uh, the average expectation was for around 3.7%. And in the oh. bank's business outlook survey, same deal. So what's, what's amazing about that, Peter, is that it might actually mean that the central banks are right uh, because the central banks are so credible. So if those expectations, um, even though you know the, 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 some of the indicators that you show, if inflation expectations still remain anchored, now not anchored at 2%, but are only 3.2, which is what you just said. Um, if expectations stay that low, then maybe in fact, uh, actual inflation will be able to be contained. Uh, but let me turn this to investment because that's another indicator mm -hmm. of how businesses are feeling. You didn't say that much about investment, um, but I, I do wonder what you can tell us about how uh, how optimistic firms are in this environment. Now, of course, they weren't very optimistic 18 months ago for good reason. But 18 months later, as vaccination rates are really rising, and as you say, the economy is just rocking back uh, into uh, you know, firing on all four cylinders or more, um, what does investment look like? And then I wanna connect this to this I the longer term idea of slower growth because of secular stagnation. But what can you tell us right now about how Canadian firms or firms elsewhere are, are, are looking at investment? This is a fascinating question in our economy right now. We, uh, you know, the world economy slowed and got into this secular stag stagnation mode post global financial crisis. And, you know, I'm one of those who believes that this was not a permanent thing. We had such a great bubble ahead of the global financial crisis that it was not going to be solved in the standard two years after the recession. This was going to take a long time. The difficulty is we're in a very just-in-time, uh, now-focused, short-term horizon, short-term thinking kind of world where you know if you're actually trying to get rid of last cycle's bubble and it takes five years, that's an eternity. And that's a, that's a new normal in most people's uh, views. Okay, back to investment then. What does this actually mean for investment? What did it mean for investment? Well, we didn't need to invest for quite a number of years at standard rates. And once we got through all of this, that mentality had become wired into everybody's thinking. So investment, in my view, actually acted as a suppressor for the economy from about 2016 on. Then we hit the pandemic and people say, oh, okay, well, now we're going into another uh, one of these new normal kinds of situations. And Klaus Schwab's own uh, book, The Great Reset says, oh, this is going to be the same thing again. You know, we're going to go down and we're going to have a long, long uh, exit out of this whole thing. Completely wrong because the, the preconditions for all of this, of course, were 
very significant pent up demand. We had underinvested in housing. We had underinvested in in business investment. We had underconsumed for a long period of time, according to the standard long run natural markers. And so coming in with pent up demand suggested that when we came through this thing, the economy was going to be rocketing up and we'd have all these supply constraints that we have at the moment. Okay, what's the role of investment inside of all of this? Well, to keep the lights on in their businesses, many had to invest in technology right away in the pandemic. Think about retailers and curbside delivery or online ordering platforms and so forth. If they weren't into those, boy, did they have to get into them quickly. So there was a lot of leapfrog investment that was happening at that time. And of course, anybody that had a platform was gussying theirs up because now they were using it much more intensively. So there was a rush of investment that happened there. And of course, we pushed the frontier on adopting technology at the time. And all kinds of other businesses looked at what was going on and said, we've got to do the same. We've got to do this in order to keep up. So normally when the bottom drops out of the economy, of course, investment is one of the first things to shut down and it takes a long time to come back. This time around, it led growth and it continues to do so at the moment. And I think it was because, you know, we got that cattle prod that said, okay, we need to invest. We've been underinvesting, and we've got to keep the lights on. And now they're saying, oh boy, this is actually not a bad thing. You know, we've, we've got the appearance of capacity constraints right now. Let's keep this thing going. Good. Okay. So final question, because then I think the tables are going to turn, but my final question is you didn't say a lot about the fiscal situation. So, uh, do, uh, should we not talk about it? Is there nothing there? Or I mean, I've got some views about the fiscal situation. I was a little bit surprised you didn't say much about it. So, well, great, great question, Chris. And let's let's segue into that right away. I mean, it's 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 delicate ground for somebody who's a quasi civil servant uh, here, um, but it's very very important to our audience today because, of course, as as you and I both know, clean tech initiatives have been greatly helped uh, by fiscal programs. And so we can look at our situation at the moment and say, well, is, is all of that at risk? Uh, you know, the pandemic has been very costly in a fiscal sense. I mean, Canada's debt to GDP ratio is one of the best in the OECD, floating somewhere between 80 and 90%. And it was only that high because of the global financial crisis itself. But now the OECD is, the OECD is telling us that by the time we get to next year or the end of next year, we're going to be floating somewhere between 130 and 140. I mean, back in 1990, you know, what ushered in uh, exactly. the period of great reconciliation was a debt to GDP ratio that was moving in on 100. Right. So if we're between 100 and 140, let me pass it back to the, the chair, the ex-chair of the Ecofiscal Commission and ask you, well, what do you think? Uh, how do you actually um, you know, digest numbers that have deteriorated that much? And what is the message for folks around the table right now? Are things really at risk or you know, are the modern monetary theorists gonna to come to the rescue uh, here and, uh, and actually help us out? So, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, um, so I am concerned about this, but let me, let me preface my comments by saying, I think, uh, and here it's mostly about the federal government in Canada, I think the relief programs, and I think that's the way to think of them, not stimulus programs, but the financial relief programs that have ended up costing, you know, in the ballpark of $300 billion at the federal level over the past 18 months. I think those were largely good programs. We could certainly quibble about details, but when you've got the economy being shut down and people basically can't work, can't generate income, can't pay the bills, I think both uh, the relief packages to households and businesses, small and large, I think make a lot of sense. I think You've got, to, you've got to end them. And uh, I'm glad to see that they actually ended some of them uh, this week or uh, this week, I think. Um, but I do think there's a little too much complacency about the accumulation of the debt. So when I look at the federal provincial combined fe um, public debt, I see that we are only, only a few percentage points below where we were in the early 1990s uh, when we had said that we hit the debt wall. Now, I like to think about this in terms of net debt, and I know at other times uh, people like to compare gross debt. 
But in terms of net debt, we are only a few percentage points below where we were in the mid 90s when we thought we had hit the debt wall. So to me, that means we've got to start thinking seriously about bringing that debt to GDP ratio back down again. Now, that means you've got to think about tax increases, in which case you have a difficult difficult question about which taxes are you going to increase. That's politically a difficult conversation to have. Or you think about cutting back other spending. And that, of course, invites another politically difficult conversation. But I think you've got to talk about it. Now, the one response to this uh, counter argument is, well, don't worry, Chris, the debt GDP ratio is high. And that's other things being equal bad. But interest rates are now much lower than they were in the mid 1990s. And that's true. And so our debt service charges are much lower. Uh, several percentage points of GDP lower than they were in the mid 1990s. My counter argument to that is interest rates on government debt are a market price. They can change on a dime if you're not careful. And so while I don't think we're in a situation like Greece in 2011, where they had a 185% debt to GDP ratio and all of a sudden bondholders didn't want their debt, I don't think we're in that situation now. And I frankly don't think we're going to get there. But we could easily be in a situation where uh, bond yields start backing up. Now, this comes back to the inflation discussion. If inflation expectations really start to rekindle, that will start backing up uh, uh, nominal bond yields on government debt. But also, if people, if bondholders start to see um, that the massive increase in indebtedness across all advanced countries, not just Canada, but all advanced countries starts to push up real yields. Both of those things are entirely possible. And you know they might not happen overnight, but they could easily happen over the next three months or three years or anything in between. And if those interest rates do go up by a few hundred basis points, which would be entirely possible, then all of a sudden we can't be too complacent about those low interest rates. So I guess my concern is, you know, I don't, I don't want to suggest that the sky is falling in a fiscal sense. I don't think it is. Um, but I would be more comfortable if I heard our politicians, elected decision makers on the fiscal side, actually talking about the need to make some tough decisions. But I don't hear that. And I wish I did hear that. So you got the attention of everybody around the table, I'm sure. All 1,000 people are raptly engaged in, the, in, in this right now because... Uh, let me put it this way. When you were doing your work on the Eco Fiscal Commission, you had the benefit of, of fiscal policy in Canada, whether, whether it was federal or whether it was consolidated, that was the envy of the rest of the OECD. That gives you more bandwidth to be able to do things on the clean tech side of things in an economy. So let me, let me just ask, you know, the delicate question, you know, in the work that you were actually doing at that time, if you had to do that work with the paradigm that we're faced with at the moment, how would that change? Well, this is a great question. So the Ecofiscal Commission was something, as you described in, when you introduced me, it was from 2014 to 2019. It's over now. Uh, and it was all um, motivated by the desire to increase the use of very economically friendly environmental policies, and in particular, the pricing of pollution. Three quarters of our work was about the pricing of carbon. Uh, and you now see that Canada has a carbon price from coast to coast to coast, whether it's brought to you by your local province or whether it's brought to you by the federal government, we have a carbon price in this country. So we made tremendous progress. I don't, I don't credit all of this to Ecofiscal. I, I hope that we played some significant role in that. But um, we now have a carbon price across the country. We have a really solid foundation for very good climate policy. Now, your question is a really good one. If we had been talking about it five years ago with today's fiscal situation, um, would it have changed things? Well, I, you know, the fiscal situation is different, but again, the sky's not falling. I think the biggest problem with getting Canadians and Canadian governments to think about climate policy was to think about um, partly the economics, but also um, the politics. And you know, we weren't politicians at the Ecofiscal Commission. We were what we were there is to say, look, you can do this in an economically sensible way. If you price carbon and you use those revenues to you know funnel back into the economy, whether you're helping to invest in clean tech publicly or privately, or whether you're using it to cut other taxes, 
Um, where that discussion now is, I think we're actually get, moving to another chapter. So carbon pricing is now in place. The federal government has now said that that carbon price will rise to $170 per ton by 2030. But now the federal government has also embarked on a, on a target of net zero by 2050. And that is going to make clean tech in this country, um, that and the carbon price combined, I think are going to make clean tech the hot, hot topic. So whether it is public investments in clean tech or whether it is private investments in clean tech, or whether it is public and private partnerships investing in clean tech, and my guess is we will see all of those things. I think the, the big, big discussion in the next several years will be, what does the transition to net zero look like? What are the policies that can help us get there? And a carbon tax, I think, or a carbon price is a huge part of it, but it's not all of it. But also, what are the private sector opportunities and risks? Because there are both um, in terms of you know, moving to net zero, net zero. You can imagine that the fossil fuel producing sector is gonna have some bumps along the way, but for every risk, there is an opportunity because anytime we say that, you know, fossil fuels are part of the problem and we have to, you know, watch those emissions, we also say that anything that doesn't produce emissions is a huge opportunity. And so I think that is gonna be the discussion we're gonna have in terms of clean tech investment for the next, you know, several years. Well, we're, we're just getting wound up in this uh, conversation here. We're just getting going. Uh, and unfortunately, we've run out of time. But I think that you have left us off uh, on, on a great uh, note there, just in terms of, one, the momentum having been created here, and two, the momentum continuing to be fueled by what it is that we're holding ourselves to going forward. So there, those are two very, very good messages for our listeners today. Dr. Chris Reagan, thank you so much, my good friend, for uh, joining us today and a very informative uh, contribution, a great uh, conversation that we have had. Hope to have another one again, uh, just like it. And folks, thank you for having us. Thank you for being uh, with us today. I'm Peter Hall, Chief Economist at EDC. All the very best to you in your business as you go forward. Have a great clean tech week, and we look forward to talking soon. Thank you, everybody. I would like to once again thank you, Peter, for this presentation, and would like to thank Chris for joining us today with your insights into the global economy and their implications for Canada's clean tech sector. Before I introduce our next panel, I'd like to introduce our final two 2021 export stars. To begin, please join me in congratulating Terramera Inc., a company who is reducing synthetic chemicals and making organic ones more effective. Terramar is a Vancouver-based sustainable agricultural technology company. Our core question, how can we use technology to unlock intelligence in nature so that we can build a world that can uh, thrive and provide for everyone? So what sets Terramar apart is our understanding of chemistry and molecules and our ability to model and track those molecules. So we're focused on, on applying our technology to achieve three big audacious goals by the end of this decade. First of all, using our Actigate green chemistry platform to reduce the synthetic pesticides that are used in agriculture by 80% uh, globally. Second, to increase farm productivity and profitability by at least 20%. If we could do that and scale that globally, that'd be enough to feed another billion people. And third, to increase soil organic carbon by at least 100%. Uh, export is critical to our strategy. EDC came in as a early investor into Terramera, uh, both investing in 2016 and then again in 2019. EDC also supported us in the accelerated growth service and uh, looking at our business uh, holistically to see what areas they could provide support and advice and tools and products like uh, accounts receivable insurance. You know, it's governments and investors have been pushing 
companies and society to get to net zero commitments, and that has really uh, forced companies to to look at how they decarbonize and, and lower their GHG emissions. And so, this intelligent agriculture area of the business is is focused on building on one side tools for farmers to make that easier to uh, you know adapt and support sustainable and regenerative practices, and on the other side to support those who are interested in sequestering carbon in soils to be able to buy carbon offsets in a way that is reliable. So the, the future looks bright, sustainable, and even regenerative. Congratulations to the team at Terramera for this recognition. Finally, I'd like to introduce the third export star. Please join me in congratulating Expert C Solutions Inc., a company who is using AI in precision farming, making aquaculture more sustainable. Expert C is a technology company. The core of what we do is help uh, shrimp farmers farm shrimp better by bringing them data and visibility into the production so that they can get better yield, more profitability, and better manage the farm. And what sets us apart is uh, the fact that over the years we collected billions of uh, image and data point about shrimp production. So that really gives us an advantage into understanding uh, how to be successful at growing shrimp, how to manage risk, how to predict also the yield of shrimp production so that farmers can reduce the amount of feed that's required to uh, grow the animals. They can also make sure that there's no disease so there's a lot less loss and then you're able to manage environmental impacts much better with the lowest uh, carbon footprint. We truly believe that if you know farmers have education, have data to take better decisions, they can, you know, we can really have a great source of protein and increase food security through aquaculture. Working with EDC to help ensure some of the account receivables that we have with our customers, uh, you know, allowed us to raise money to be able to finance farmers and do it in a way that is scalable and sustainable. Uh, EDC has helped us scale our business and be able to attract great investors. We started in South America, in, the, in Ecuador, and then we're opening in Asia, uh, in India, and then Thailand, Vietnam. And so we're really looking, looking into these countries where there's a lot of production. So our goal is to keep having an impact from farm all the way to fork and to uh, help the industry through data, but also capitalizing the uh, value chain, bringing transparency uh, and making sure that you know, producers get the return for the good quality product and that consumer have access to high quality, uh, affordable and sustainable seafood. Congratulations to both Terramera Inc. and Expert C Solutions for being Export Star recipients. We look forward to seeing what you'll accomplish in the months and years to come. And on behalf of EDC, congratulations once again to all our 2021 Export Stars. I'll also note that new this year, we will be launching a series of articles so that we can catch up on past Export Star winners. Keep an eye out on our website and social media channels to read these feature articles and past winners.